Sometimes you just need to take the slips out and bowl defensively. And you also need to be careful with your computer's defense as well. If you need a VPN, go Nord. NordVPN.com forward slash Kimber to get a two year contract with a discount plus four extra months and gifts in some markets. It's completely risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. So put in some dot balls and turn them into maidens via NordVPN.com forward slash Kimber. Name and job title, please. Behram Kazi, who is a podcaster at Good Areas and Pro Sports Pakistan and the video content lead at Grassroots Cricket. First one sounds good. Anyway, um, <laughs> reasons behind, uh, d- uh, l- let me know why Lahore had a terrible season. What? What? Because they were, what, back-to-back champs? Yeah, they were the first ever team to become back-to-back champs in the PSL. And uh, they had arguably the greatest ever you know, bowling attack assembled in franchise T20 cricket. They had peak Shaheen, peak Haris Rauf, Zaman Khan and his slingy bowling at the death. And uh, they had Rashid Khan, who is a bit of a cheat code in T20s. And then the remainder of the four overs were often bowled by David Wiesa and Sikandar Raza. But so that's as good as it gets, really. And uh, this season, Rashid Khan wasn't available. Of course, uh, he was, uh, you know, in recovery from surgery and Due to that rehab process, he was not a- available for this PSL. They knew that though, and they still retained him. And they did not draft a replacement for Rashid Khan. Now, granted, you can never truly replace Rashid Khan, right? He is in a league of his own. Mm. And you can't just bring someone in and say that, oh, this guy will do Rashid's job. But they didn't even come close to that, right? Like Lahore went with no spinners and all of the spinners that they had in the squad were basically PDP products, which are, you know, cricketers who evolved from their own academy, which a lot I of people have. I thought you meant Peter Delapena for a minute, and I was no. very confused. They're not associate like, is, products. <laughs> is PDP um, training spinners? Because I wouldn't trust a spinner trained by PDP. <laughs> well, I wouldn't trust a spinner trained by the actual PDP either, right? Uh, I mean, it was very, very bad. Uh, they had some part-timers in George Linda who did well on a few occasions, but basically Lahore in nine completed fixtures, because one was rained out, they were only able to one or win a solitary game, right? Which is quite bad. And I get that you didn't have Rashid, so that automatically makes everything harder. But, uh, and also I'll give them the fact that David Wiesa got injured mid-tournament and was unavailable for a lot of those games. And he's a difficult cricketer to replace because mm. he's a bit of a cult hero in Lahore as well, has been clutch for them. And then Haris Rauf, uh, even though was you know, in a terrible run of form and had been having some issues with the PCB as well, is still currently having those issues. He dislocated his shoulder in the one game where he actually performed. So they lost Visa and Harris Rauf after four games and they'd lost all of those four games. But I still feel that Lahore should have been better. And uh, one main reason why I think that they, you know, failed royally is because Shaheen Shah Afridi's captaincy was all over the place. Now, he did bowl some, you know, quick spells in this PSL. I'll give him that. The pace was back up, mm. but he was leaking runs. And that's still a worry because Shaheen is supposed to be, you know, strike bowler supreme. And whenever he does well, Lahore does well, right? Uh, in the previous PSL, he was taking more wickets and was leaky. This time he took, what, 14 wickets and was still leaky. And he was going at, what, eight and a half and over by the end of it. Uh, they picked too many top order batters, right? Abdullah Shafiq, Rasi van der Dusen, uh, Sahib Zada Farhan, who is, you know, a domestic champ. And they also had their own PDP opening prodigy, Mirza Tahir Beg, plus Fakhar Zaman. So you have all of these top order batters. Shea Hope, add Shea Hope to that, right? Mm. And uh, I just did not understand how they're going to kind of figure that combination out, which they weren't able to do right till the very end, right? And uh, I believe that even though they had so many missing players. You know, it was uh, a shit show when it comes to drafting. It was probably the worst draft they've ever had. Sikandar Raza Butt was underused. This is the guy who had, you know, a splendid ILT20, was the player of the tournament, if I'm not wrong. And uh, Shaheen was batting ahead of him. They barely gave him any deliveries to do his thing, right? And uh, he was under bold as well. Rasi van der Dusen was actually the lone warrior for Lahore. And I believe that even though Shaheen did not have those sort of resources that he had in the past. And let's be honest, if you're managing that sort of bowling attack that they had in the previous two seasons, I mean, anyone can kind of do it, just turn up, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when things got tough, uh, he was all over the place. 
there was this one guy Essen Bhatti who was not a good batter not a good bowler and he'd be sending him in the top 4 he's bowling the second over in the power play stuff like that really stupid stuff right and shahin himself promotes himself up the order now that comes off sometimes right but not always and i don't want to see shahin shah afridi batting at 5 on the regular so i believe that uh, it was poor drafting and poor captaincy and yeah if not for rasi they might not even have won a single game because he was like that one guy who was scoring runs for them it was uh, a season to forget for lahore and they're one of those teams that they either play the final or don't make it to the playoffs right out of nine seasons it's six playoff exits three finals two psl titles so not particularly surprised no um tell me about baba azam How, what was what's the narrative with him Yeah so it was probably the biggest story or one of the biggest stories to come out of this PSL of course uh, no one is uh, let's say um stranger to the Babar Azam strike rate conversation i believe that it was nuanced to begin with obviously there was a bit of an issue over there but it wasn't the biggest issue for pakistan you know ever maybe the combination of him and rizwan and them not going at a faster yeah. rate uh, is definitely something that needed to be talked about and they kind of you know in the national team broke that pair up but uh, babar had a splendid psl right he scored 569 runs in 11 innings which is the second second most by any batter in the competition ever uh, only fakhr zaman is higher than him who had what uh, i believe uh, 588 in 13 innings something like that so babar played less innings as well and his strike rate was north of 142 now that would have been even higher had it not been for those two playoff games in karachi where he had to bat in some uh, on some sluggish surfaces uh before that he was striking at over 150 and that was the main takeaway now he was not dismissed in the power play uh, by a bowler ever the one time he was dismissed in the power play was uh, by virtue of a run out and in the power play we saw babar attack right it was actually after the power play where he kind of slowed down in the middle overs and i asked him this question in a presser that i have noticed this trend in your batting and he said that it's because wickets are falling at the other end and i'm consolidating at that point otherwise i wouldn't do it interestingly enough you know he's someone who's known for his catch up knocks he had one catch up knock in this psl more or less uh, and in that knock he got uh, his first 50 or 40 odd balls and then ended up with 111 of uh, 63 so he actually you know made the most of that uh, catch up knock and uh, you know Uh, Babar had a terrible 2023. I would say even across formats mm, because in ODI yeah. cricket he didn't turn up versus the big teams. He turned up versus Nepal. In Test cricket he averaged 22, and in T20 cricket he absolutely, you know, dropped the ball. He was just not even close to the numbers that he was himself producing a couple of years back. So I would say that uh, Babar Azam basically uh, was demoted in Pakistan's national team to first drop. and in this psl he could have let simon harris open right it kind of makes sense as well but babar was like no i'm going to open and i think he was making a statement that i should be opening for pakistan as well and if you end the tournament with 569 runs at a strike rate north of 142 which was 150 odd prior to the first or the last two games i think he's pretty much made his case over here and i think that um him opening the batting for pakistan alongside simon Sa- yub should be a no brainer at this point but uh, yeah it was one of those tournaments which made you believe again that babar is in fact an elite batter who had a shit year the only sad part is that it's one of his peak years right that he wasted he should have made the most of it and should have been one of his golden years especially with an odi world cup so that was a big miss for him but uh, one hopes against hope that uh, he's picked up his form again and this evolution of him as a t20 batter and not just with respect to strike rate i saw him apply some of uh, you know uh, some uncalled for or not uncalled for but some out of the box unorthodoxy right babar was ramping babar was ramping over third man as well it was interesting to see yeah and, yeah and he was actually looking to strike in the power play which he did quite successfully in the one game he didn't he got 100 uh, of 63 deliveries 111 so i think for him this was a great tournament of course he didn't end up winning it got knocked out by islamabad in the second eliminator but yeah overall i'd say one of the better storylines to come out of the PSL and it's shut up a lot of critics which is constantly an exhausting conversation in Pakistan it's babar fc versus everyone else he's either the best thing since sliced bread or the worst thing since imran farid's catching ability so yeah i'm i'm happy that at least we've come back to some normalcy with respect to babar scoring runs um i think since almost since the time we did the podcast about babar fc they've had nothing to talk about other than how much they hate both of us so yeah. it's good that they can talk about him making runs again um uh so i'm oh you just talked about him so 
He's played like a bunch of games for Pakistan, mm. but not really made any runs before. And he, he looked like a bit of a bits and pieces player to me. I don't even think he's bowled for Pakistan before. Mm. Um, he did pretty well. Yeah. I mean, Saeb Ayub uh, first played the PSL for the Quetta Gla- Gladiators and he was terrible, right? Everyone was wondering why was he their emerging pick? Like this kid just does not have it. But he worked on his game. He's got first class runs as well. So I like that. I like it when uh, batters perform in red ball cricket and then come. 40, and 44 his... first class average. Not many yeah. games, but 44 yeah. so far. That, that's not bad. And, uh, really you know, good. he uh, is a destructive bat. He also has a very wide range. So if you pitch it up to him on the offside, he's going to go up and over extra cover, towering sixes, right? If you go short wide of off stump, he's going to step out of his crease versus the fast bowler and slap them over point for six. If you give him anything on his legs or hip, you know, full or short, it's going to the fine leg uh, boundary for six or four. It's almost a show short thing. He has a no-look shot as well. He has a bit of unorthodoxy about him. And he plays really fast. Like his 345 runs that he scored in this PSL came at a strike rate of 157.53. So Saim Ayub is someone who should be opening for Pakistan here on. And he, so he doesn't need to go to the army camp? and uh, <laughs> No, also. definitely not. If the chairman saw any of those Saima Yub sixes, uh, he should know that you know maybe he can miss the army camp, uh, even if the army camp is supposed to help anyone in that regard. But uh, he has a lot of flamboyance, a lot of poise, uh, reminds people of Saeed Anwar, even though he's more aerial than Saeed Anwar, I would say. You know, I and, think uh, all modern players are more aerial than the old players. Basically, yeah. But uh, he was a bit of a revelation with the ball. Now, I always saw him as uh, a part-timer of a part-timer, not even just a regular part-timer, right? But this kid was bowling in the power play, so important overs. And not only was he frugal, he went at an economy of uh, seven and a half. He also took eight wickets. He got Alex Hales twice, but I don't know how much that counts for in modern-day T20 cricket. And uh, yeah, when you add you know, his pace variations with the ball, especially the new ball and the carom ball, that's the big one, right? He gets to kind of turn it both ways in a way. So I feel like he's giving Pakistan's national side a lot of options. Now, I don't foresee them using him in the power play. And he would be a buffer over bowler at best. But for Peshawar, he was an important bowler. And yeah, but even, with the even one or two overs is mm. you know, going to be handy for Pakistan, isn't it? If they yeah. can occasionally throw him the ball. If you look at him as a package, you know, destructive opening batter, left-hander, no-look shots. Wide range, uh, very, very good on the offside as well. And with the ball, he's got uh, the pace variations and the carom ball and the regular off spinner and can bowl in the power play. Add phenomenal boundary rider to this list. He's a great overall package and he did end up as the best all-rounder of the PSL. So I think he has a really bright future ahead of him. I just hope that no Pakistan coaches come and tell Sam that, hey, you know, you should put a price on your wicket and not be so destructive because that is a very Pakistani thing to do. I just hope they don't do that with him and let him be Saim Ayub because this kid is something special and he won the CPL as well earlier mm. uh, last year. And he did well in the West Indies, right? So that's good news for Pakistan going into a World Cup which is going to be played in the USA and the Caribbean. So I think uh, in terms of uh, bright young talents, Saim Ayub ruled the roost uh, this PSL. He's definitely a short shot starter for Pakistan in T20s. If that does not happen and if we continue to see Babar Rizwan open ahead of uh, Babar and Saim, I would be uh, flabbergasted. Uh, I wouldn't be, but um, <laughs> I, I could see why it would annoy you. Uh, what about any young spinners coming through? Because that's the best kind of thing, right? Like, you know, but there's some batting and there's some seam bowling, but is there any, no, not so much for the World Cup, but, you know, in someone that you saw that you thought over the next two or three years could be, you know, quite good. Can I run you by some emerging players just before that? Before yeah, we come sure. to the spinners? Yeah. So, uh, the PSL is known for having some, you know, superstar emerging players coming to the fore and kind of debuting for Pakistan there on. We saw Esanullah, the tearaway quick last year, uh, who kind of, you know, fucked up his elbow. So, he's out of contention right now and didn't play this PSL. Shadab Khan is also a prime example. Back in the day, he just rose onto the scene and, you know, got selected for Pakistan right away, won a Champions Trophy. So, it's one of those tournaments where you have to play at least one emerging player and have to select like two or three in your squad. Mm. And every season we see some kid, you know, come through the ranks and kind of stake their claim. This year wasn't very much like those staple PSL seasons of the past. I mean, there was Hunayn Shah, who is Naseem's younger brother or middle child because he's got another young, younger brother in Obed Shah who just played the Under-19 World Cup. All three of those uh, 
Seamers or brothers, the Shah brothers were in Islamabad United. Uh, Hunain hit the winning runs of the PSL, but as a bowler, he has to develop a whole lot more right now. That Pakistan cap is a far way away. I liked him with both the new ball and in the death, but uh, you know, they're better options right now. And there were times where he, you know, copped plenty of runs as well. You saw those 16, 17 run overs. Uh, and he's a terrible field, uh, mind you. Uh, he dropped so many catches this PSL. I don't actually think that he caught many. He probably must have caught like one or two and dropped 15. I am exaggerating, but that's what it felt like. Even in the final, he dropped the catch, right? So he's in the conversation, but not quite there yet. Irfan Khan Niazi, he played for the Karachi Kings and has been playing for them for two seasons now, is still an emerging pick or was still an emerging pick this season. Uh, Phil Simmons, I interviewed him and he was coaching uh, Karachi Kings. He was their head coach. He was mad impressed by Irfan Khan Niazi. And the reasons are that this guy is a killer boundary rider. And when I say killer, I, I, say Kyron Pollard light because he is taking those parried catches. He's stopping sixes, being athletic and all, and he's just not dropping any, right? He did drop one or two towards the end, but up until that game, he was absolutely phenomenal in the field, whether it be catching or ground fielding. He also got a few runouts. So electric in the field and also someone who can hit a long ball. And this is also someone who performed really, really, really well in the first class season this year, uh, got a double hundred. So he did bag the award for emerging player of the season. And I do feel that he has a proper, you know, career ahead of him. I even, if I were to go left field as a Pakistan selector, I'd say just pick him for the fielding. Have him in as a subfielder and maybe the boundary riding isn't an issue anymore. But he wouldn't have been my pick for emerging player of the season. I would have given that to Jahandad Khan. This is a young uh, pace bowling all-rounder who played for Lahore Kalandas. Very simple dude. I was in the presser with him and he just didn't know what to say, right? He was overawed by the occasion and uh, someone who just literally turns up to play cricket and probably doesn't have a personality outside that. He uh, had long levers and wristy long levers. So wristy some of the sixes, long levers, you should yeah. get that on a t-shirt. Think Shiv, Shivam Dube, Hardik Pandya, think, those yeah. sort of sixes, yeah? Uh, that's the sort of hitting that he displayed. And I think he deserved more of an opportunity. Like some of those games where Shaheen promoted himself up the order, maybe Jahadad should be promoted up the order just to see what he can do. And uh, he looked pretty good against spin, hitting against spin. I really like what I saw in this kid because batting aside, he took one of the catches of the PSL, a one-handed screamer running back oh, yeah. on the side. Like he picked it up like this, right? Running back. It was crazy. And uh, on top of that, as a bowler, he offered a lot of variations and he's still young. So he could develop and maybe add a few clicks to his bowling and that could make him into a prime commodity. He could maybe be uh, the sort of player that Fahim Ashraf could never develop into and no disrespect to Fahim, but he is a bits and pieces player, right? Mm. Uh, Jahadad could excel at at least one of those two skills. And uh, right now it's really, you know, up to him what he wants to develop as because I was impressed with his fielding his batting and his bowling and his slow ones definitely did cause some people trouble, right? So I would say that he was the most promising emerging player from this PSL, even though the award went to Irfan Khan Niazi. But overall, if you compare it to all nine seasons, in terms of emerging talent, this one wasn't as fun. Let's just say that. Mm. A lot of people complain that I'm not a former cricketer. I said that I don't really know the game. Well, you know what they can't claim? Then I don't know desks. I've been using desks for years. I'm a collector of desks, old and new, and I'm sitting on a new one right now. I'm the Don Bradman of sitting at desks. So when I tell you that the E7 Pro next generation height adjustable desk from FlexiSpot is legit. This is like Michael Jordan talking to you about sneakers. This desk holds 160 kilograms. It is as stable as anything I've ever seen, and it has under desk cable management. But really, the main skill here is that this desk rises and falls at the push of a button, and it moves super quick. And it has so many settings that remember your favorite heights. It really does it all. And I could not recommend the E7 Pro from FlexiSpot anymore, even though I am currently sitting on one of FlexiSpot's BS12 Pro multifunctional, adjustable, upgraded fabric ergonomic chairs. My butt and computer have never been happier than when using one of FlexiSpot's products. So get over to their page right now for big savings. Uh, did you give me any spinners? I don't think you gave me any spinners. No, uh, there was this one uh, kid, Mehran Mumtaz. He didn't qualify as emerging, I believe, because he was capped in the Asian Games, which kind of screwed over some of these players, right? Uh, they were capped for Pakistan because of the Asian Games. And Pakistan's first string team didn't play those games. So they mm. weren't emerging players in this PSL. And then 
obviously it was hard yeah. to fit him in the 11 so maybe that's one of the big reasons why we didn't see a lot of these players uh, perform because arafat bin has the under 19 world cup star who was also really good in the pjl uh, a couple of years back he only got two games and bowled in one and in the one game he bowled uh, he returned figures of 1 for 11 and was beating barber's bat So that's a big miss that he didn't get more games, and Karachi Kings really should have gone for him over Mohammad Nawaz. Like, why go for someone who's tried and tested and is woefully out of form uh, ahead of someone who performed at the Under-19 World Cup, has been doing really well in junior cricket, and is a bit of a prodigy, right, with both bat and ball? And he was getting that ball to break as well, good wicket-to-wicket stuff. So I think Arafat was robbed of game time, and Mehran Mumtaz also came into the fray later into, into the tournament. But in his first two games. Mehran was what uh, he had figures of uh, two for forty-two or three for forty-two in eight overs. Uh, left arm off spinner who bowls quick, right? That's basically his brand of bowling. And uh, I'm told that he's no mug with the bat either, but I haven't seen any of that yet, right? He was good, and he was bowling in the power play and in the middle overs for Peshawar. And as soon as he played his first game, he was a starter. So I would say that that kid could go places, but. If you're talking about you know potential alone, Arafat Minhas is your guy because he can also bat a bit and uh, yeah, he's very young. Yes, I've so my worry, my worry is with someone who can bat a bit is that we'll end up with another Iftikhar, Imad mm-hmm. Wasim, Shadab Khan. Shadab, well, they're fine. Yeah, you know what I mean. But like at a certain point, can we pick a spinner who's really good at bowling spin? Um, yeah, I it, mean, so I almost, I almost want him to be worse with the bat. Is what yeah. I'm saying. Um, I mean, what, what about? Yeah, yeah, the spinners sorry. did well, right? I'm not going to say they didn't uh, do well at all in this PSL. Like, uh, weirdly enough, you'd be surprised to know the stat. Uh, for a minimum of ten overs, the most economical bowler, forget spinner, the most economical bowler in this PSL was Shoaib Malik. His economy was six point three nine, and Karachi Kings were using him in the power play regularly. That was something. Got to Shand impress Masood that did. new bride, man. <laughs> you got to, and uh, yeah, no, no, no balls that I can uh, recall from Malik uh, in this PSL. Um, but yeah, that's that's a surprising uh, stat. Um, but uh, yeah, apart from Mehran Mumtaz and Arafat, I think Zahid Mahmood for Karachi. I thought he was washed. I thought he was yesterday's spinner, and you know he's done really poorly for Pakistan. But for Karachi, he did really, really well. Got wickets, was frugal. Uh, probably can't play for Pakistan though, no chance. And then Usman Tariq, did you see this kid or not, kid? Did you see this dude? Looks exactly no. like Bazid Khan stops in his action, and I don't say like oh Hafiz yes, I did. Uh, yeah, I see him. Yeah, he completely yeah. stops. Got flagged mid tournament as well. Uh, action got called out uh, for a bit of a jerk, but then he returned after some tests. So I'm not sure. Maybe you know the ICC will intervene at some point. Um, it's not the stop though that that caused the issue. It's probably the the degree. Wow. Uh, It's. Uh, do you know what? I would guess that the stop is playing a part because. Hmm. When you're doing that, you then have to force the ball down. And if you're a finger spinner and you force the ball down, quite often your arm has to straighten. There is a reason why finger spinners need at least a couple of steps of of uh, you know um, through that. So it might have played a part, especially in, if it's just a few deliveries. It's less likely that he has he is a thrower, more likely that he just has a few deliveries that don't work because he's trying to force the ball. Yeah, he has variations. Don't don't get me wrong. Like he can bowl a multitude of different sorts of deliveries, but I don't see that action action be repeatable in the long run. I feel like he's going to wear out quickly. And I mean, it's it's one of those wild card things. He didn't do too well uh, after coming back from that uh, short ban uh, or suspension. Uh, but I would say that the two best spinners in the tournament were Osama Mir, as you know, twenty four wickets. But economy was eight point one three. And either he was really good in some games, like two for sixteen or six for forty sort of stuff, mm. or he'd be going for sixty-eight and four overs. And I'm sure you caught the final where he gave away or or, or was uh, hammered for three sixes for uh, by Marty Guptill, you know, yesterday's opener uh, in his first over of the day, and that kind of like changed the momentum for Islamabad. And he ended up with figures of three for thirty-six, or sorry, one for thirty-six and three overs in the final. That's my worry with Osama Mir. He does well. in these long patches in the middle convinces everybody that he is international material and then when the going gets tough he kind of just completely loses the game for his op- or, or for his team and the opposition pounces on him big time we saw it in the world cup he was taken apart he had a very torrid run and i get that he's like a tall spinner and he gets bounce and all of that stuff and he was you know he looked i i spoke to him about this and he said he looked at his old videos and now that's the reason why he's gone back to some stuff and is bowling better Alex Hartley worked with him. She was a huge fan, but I'm worried with Usama Mir because you've already got Shadab Khan in the T20 team, and Shadab, just because he bats well, 
in the middle overs is going to play. So do you want to have two of those same guys who bowl in the middle overs? It's not like Osama bowls in the power play, which is why I would be hesitant to select him oh, for I, Pakistan. I think it's fine if he bowls in the middle overs if he was better. <laughs> yeah, let's you know what I mean. Way. Like, like if you trusted him 100, percent that I don't think that's an issue at all. But clearly, I well, I don't, and I, yeah. I'm, I'd be shocked if Pakistan do. I I would be surprised if they don't select him for the New Zealand T20s because he got 24 wickets in what 12 games, right? Two wickets per game, and uh, the most wickets for any bowler in a PSL season is by Hassan Ali, who got 25. He's the next best and he's on, the only other spinner to get 20 plus wickets in a PSL season who is not Rashid Khan. So there's a lot of things that are going for him. But with Osama Amir, I'm just never ever completely sold and I feel like he's yeah. going to botch it, you know, on the big stage. And uh, if you're watching this, Osama, I'm sorry, but that's just how I honestly it's, feel it's about just you. Not, he's just not a consistent lander of the ball. And mm. so... You know, he reminds me of sort of early Ish Sodi, where mm. Ish Sodi gets a lot of wickets, but at a certain point, he's he, you can't actually rely on him. I know Ish Sodi's tightened up a little bit since then, but yeah. um, it's it, the quality of the wickets as well, Jared. Like, if you're getting a lot of tail enders, then do they really matter? Whereas on the flip side, you've got someone in Abrar Ahmed who actually is the only spinner this season who uh, got what was it, 15 plus wickets at an economy of under eight. So his economy was 7.82. His 16 wickets were quality wickets because he was often bowling in the power play and in the middle overs as well. So he was diverse with respect to the phase of the game. And he's a mystery spinner, right? So hypothetically, if you take him to the USA and West Indies, he could not be picked up or read by some opposition batters. And at least that gives you an element of wicket taking. Whereas I feel like Osama Mir is someone who, can, who they can easily study. Not to say that Abrar won't be found out. He very well could be, like Mendes was found out, right? And Abrar is someone who tweaks it with his fingers. He's a leg spinner, but not a wrist spinner as such. But he's got some variations. He's good with the new ball, and not everyone can pick him. So if I were to say that uh, Pakistan were to select one spinner out of all of the ones that we saw in this PSL, uh, it my would be would Imad be. Wazim. <laughs> yeah, Abrar Ahmed. But Imad obviously offers more, right? Abrar is just a bowler. He can't bat, or he can yeah. whack it a bit, but he can't bat. So, what? Tell me about Imad Bozim because he was kind of finished, right? Yeah. And obviously played a big part in Islamabad's win as well. So, what happened there? There's more context to the story. Imad Bozim kind of became a villain in Pakistan because he said stuff against Babur on TV. And if I'm being honest, it at times did feel a bit spiteful, right? And uh, they did this whole making up sort of uh, PR stunt, or maybe it was genuine. What do I know? When uh, Imad got selected for the Afghanistan series and Baba was captain, or not captain, but he was around. He wasn't playing that series, but they went to dinner, they posted pictures, and they were both teammates of the Karachi Kings, right? And then things fell apart. So Imad was a hated figure in Pakistan cricket. It's important to put that into context because I was at games where Baba is not playing the game. Imad is, you know, feeling in the boundary or somewhere on the rope and people are chanting Babur Babur. And this was a constant feature in the PSL. That's how toxic it got. And uh, he was garbage for the vast majority of the PSL. Let's be honest. He ended up with 12 wickets in 12 games uh, at an economy of 6.6, .6, which looks great, especially for a defensive sort of spinner like Imad yeah. Wasim, who bowls in the power play and offers a lot with the bat, which is his unique selling point, the all-round ability, not just the bowling alone, right? Can feel and as well. We all thought he was done. So he turned it around big time. Uh, in the last group game that Islamabad were playing, they were playing Multan, the best side in the tournament. They were chasing 230 odd. Imad scored uh, 30, an unbeaten 30 of 13 deliveries. And uh, the equation was seven required of two. I was at that game. It was a full house. And Islamabad were the whole team, uh, home team. Imad hit a six and a four, and the crowd went wild, right? And that's when the redemption arc you know, gained some steam because they're on in all three of the playoff games that Imad Basim played, he was player of the match. And based on that, I thought that he should be player of the tournament as well because he turned up when it mattered. He was clutch. And when I say clutch, I mean not just frugal with the ball, but incisive because all of those wickets came at the end. He took five for 23 in the final, becoming the only bowler in PSL history to get a fifer in a PSL final, right? And he was bowling slower, loopier because the pitches or uh, surfaces were a bit slow. And with the bat, he was playing some mature knocks. He was playing this MS Dhoni-esque sort of knocks of taking the game deep and calculated and controlled aggression. And, you know, he has this uh, arc 
where anything outside of stump from um, point to let's say extra cover, he has this shot nailed, right? He always gets four over there. So he was playing that a lot and he was also hitting down the ground well. And just, I want to, you know, appreciate his mental strength because the crowd was against him. Uh, he wasn't getting selected. Everything, everyone thought he was uh, yesterday's all-rounder. And he turned up and won Islamabad uh, the title. Of course, he wasn't alone in that effort, but he was the main man in those last four games, I would say. And then he also lit up a doobie in the, uh, yeah. what do you call it, uh, dressing room. After, after getting that Pfeiffer, he went full Shane Warne, going into the dressing room and lining one up. And he was smoking it in a way that you don't smoke cigarettes. So uh, you guys he can... <laughs> He was, it was definitely, um, it, it definitely looked like puff, puff, pass rather than a cigarette. But, um, it was so it's like a bad win, but you mm. said before that Multan was the best side. Um, and certainly I, I think I would generally agree with that of what I saw of the tournament. Uh, what made them good other than their bowling coach, Kath Dalton, a friend of the yeah, show? Yeah. Can I talk about Islamabad first though? You just talked about Islamabad. No, no, because there's more to it, right? They have all of these all-rounders that continually, you know, bail them out. Fahim Ashraf bailed them out in one game. Azam Khan was good in patches. Shadab Khan ended up with 300-plus uh, runs mm -hmm. at a really good strike rate and took 14 wickets with an economy of uh, eight and a half. So, yes, he's not bowling like peak Shadab when he first came, but it was better, you know, returns than he's ever had in How were his time. hips? Uh, it seemed like he was doing all right, but with the bat, I say that he's evolved into a batting all-rounder at this point because he was batting at four. And if you have both Shadab and Imad, of course, they'll have to convince Imad to come out of retirement, which I do see happening now. That would give Pakistan a good mix of all-rounders, even if those aren't the most incisive spinners in the world. It's good options to have, and I can see them fitting into the 11. But Islamabad was a proper team. You didn't have a top wicket-taker. You didn't have a top run scorer. But you ultimately have a trophy. And uh, Colin Monroe turned up in patches as well. Alex Hayes was terrible, but Guptil came in later on and hit runs like peak Martin Guptil. 50th, quick, quick fire 34, then 50 again in the final. So uh, they've won three titles now, right? And all the finals that they've played in, the three finals, they've won. There are only four other franchise teams in history to do that. And I would say that Islamabad peaked at the right time. And also... Uh, Multan is a team that have played four finals in a row and have lost three in a row, whereas Islamabad have now won three out of three. And uh, they've been one of the best teams in the PSL and now can definitely boast that tag of being the most decorated franchise in PSL history for the time being. So kudos to them. Yeah. Uh, so Multan? Yeah. Multan is an interesting one, right? Uh, a lot of people were criticizing them when they hired a host of women in their management and coaching staff. I don't think Alex Hartley has coached ever before, but she was a hit over here. She was even fasting with the team. I was surprised we haven't had that news of her converting to Islam yet because that's their favorite thing to do, right? Uh, we saw it with Michael Jackson, Will Smith, all of those people. Matt, Matthew Hayden. Uh, we didn't see it with Alex Hartley though and, and good on her for being a sport like that uh, just to kind of relate to the players and, and know what they're going through. I think she was a very solid influence on not just Osama Mir, but also Faisal Akram, who was the other young spinner in Multan's ranks who I think should have played more because he's a left arm wrist spinner who was getting a lot of break in the games that he played. So I was a touch surprised not to see him feature more. Uh, so I think Alex did a good job over there. And uh, Kath Dalton is someone who has been making frequent trips to Pakistan and has worked very closely with Ali Tareen, the owner, and his academy in Nodra. And, uh, you know, she basically uh, produced the likes of Muhammad Ali in this tournament. She can take credit for that. And Muhammad Ali is someone... I don't know if you remember this or not, but he played versus England in that, uh, you yeah. know, damned test series uh, in Pakistan and went for plenty on that road in Rawalpindi. He turned up big time this time. Got 19 wickets in 12 games. Uh, economy was 8.23, but I'll tell you what. Muhammad Ali was two different bowlers in this PSL. The Muhammad Ali that played in, in Multan was unplayable, right? And the Muhammad Ali that played outside of Multan was just your normal average Joe. So if you... Divide his numbers, I'm sure that the bulk of those wickets have come in Multan, like 13, 14, something like that. And the rest have come outside of Multan. And the economies were super in Multan as well. Like he was bowling well with the new ball. He was bowling well with the old ball. He was getting lots of carry. And he had a solid Yorker. And he was someone who could seam the ball, which is important alongside swinging it. So he had or seemed to have a complete arsenal in Multan. Kind of dropped off big time there on. But, you know, it's a good option to have for Pakistan uh, because uh, he seems to be a proper athlete. 
is a literature nerd. So he likes to read books, which is not something that you get what very What kind of frequently. books? I always hear this with cricketers and it ends up being a Tony Robbins book. I think The Great Gatsby is his favorite one, but don't quote me on that. It's a bit basic, but okay, yeah. we'll, we'll, we can pass him on that. Yeah. But I mean, he was leaking runs outside of Multan. He got whacked in Pindi, but we knew he would or that would happen to him, right? Uh, he wasn't the best pacer of the tournament. Uh, Naseem Shah was because Naseem took an, a wicket every game that he played prior to the final. Uh, his economy was seven and a half. So he was the only pacer this se- se- season who took uh, 15 or more wickets at an economy of under eight. And it looked like we have Naseem Shah of old, even though I would give it some more time. But that was a big positive as well for Islamabad. Coming back to Multan, right? The pace attack with Muhammad Ali, who did well in Multan, and David Willey, who did well everywhere. David Willey in the power play was one of Multan's big strengths. He was unplayable in the power play at times, getting the ball to shape away from the right-hander. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's someone who is very experienced, is known to be a really good power play bowler. And uh, he turned up. He was their platinum pick. He was their vice captain. And uh, I believe that he lived up to that billing. So Willie and Ali in the power play, that rhymes. I never uh, thought of that prior. And then Osama Mir in the middle overs uh, with his spin. Chris Jordan in the first eliminate or qualifier was unplayable. Uh, removed Barbara Azam with a killer Yorker. Chris Jordan was also hitting 140 odd or 145, which I was quite surprised with. He's known to be or has known to be, you know, someone who bowls a killer slower one, but that's not what he was doing this PSL. It was pinpoint Yorkers and some good hitting as well. So their bowling attack was actually very formidable. You had Willie, Ali, Osama Mir, Chris Jordan, and then they'd kind of sneak some overs from Aftab, or sorry, not Aftab, uh, Abbas Afridi when he was available, Khushdil Shah. And uh, yeah, it looked really, really good. They were the best team on paper, because, or not on paper, the best team, performing team this PSL mm. because Rizwan, even though he did not uh, score at a high strike rate, he did get uh, 400 plus runs and he was captaining really well. So tactically, I believe Mohamed Rizwan was on point and probably the best captain this PSL. Riza Hendricks was doing really well for them until he had to go. And then uh, he was replaced by Johnson Charles, who also did really well. But the star of the show for Multan with the bat was Usman Khan who now plays for the mm. UAE and played as an overseas player for, uh, for uh, Multan this season, even though he was a local player last season. This guy in 16 odd innings in the PSL throughout his PSL career has 300s and 350s. And he's the only player alongside Kamran Akmal to have scored three PSL 100s in the history of the competition. And he's the only player to score both back-to-back 100s in the PSL and 200s in the same edition of the competition. So. This guy was deservedly batter of the tournament, scored 57 or 40 in the final as well. Very interesting bat, Uh, not a sight for sore eyes. He is a bit agricultural. Mm. He uh, can lap it over or play it well over fine leg for four and can mow it uh, in between that pocket of mid wicket and mid on. So that's one area. And then on the offside, he is uh, spotless, you could say. He was cutting every ball that, you know, uh, whenever he was offered with, he he would either cut it or if it was fuller, he would like completely like smash it brutally over extra cover. It was quite a sight to behold that particular shot. But he was susceptible versus short pitch bowling. And he did kind of get found out in, in the final, even though he survived. And he did end mm. up scoring a 50. Uh, but I feel like that short ball should have been tried more versus him. But overall, you know, the batting was clicking. The bowling was clicking. And then you had Ifti Mania as a cheat code. Absolute yeah. cheat code. You know, he was striking at 193 in the PSL, scored 259 runs, I believe. And every game, it was like if he came in, smashed 30 off 8 or 25 off 8. There was this one game in which Multan had to chase like 80 to 90 runs in the last five overs. They lost by five runs because if he just went mad. And you were speaking about, you know, the chairman saying uh, Pakistani players don't hit big enough sixes. If the mania hit some of the biggest sixes in world cricket, right? He has a very strong base. He has a pointed front toe, mm. you know, which sets him up nicely. And his arc is just crazy. It doesn't matter if it's short pitched or fuller pitched. If it's facing paces at the death, he'll smash it out of the park. And he was consistently doing that. And I think he's a shoe in in Pakistan's team as well, because he's probably the best power hitter in the country right now. But they would delay his entry points so that he could play pace. And that's what they did in, they did in the final. And I think it cost them a bit because... He's, he's actually done better against spin over the last couple of years. He mm. used to be one of the slowest scorers against spin in the world. Um, and he has done better. So I don't think you need to always delay him as much. But traditionally, I, I, I think that's probably the case. Mm. Speed round, just quick one. Flop to the mm. tournament. Who didn't do very well? Quick Let me give possible. you an 11. You want me to give you an 11? I have an 11. Yeah, go. Alex, 
Alex Hales is my opener because he dropped plenty of catches and did not get a single score. And they played him right up until the final. This is not speed round. I don't need yeah. the full details. Alex <laughs> Hales is... Everyone understands Alex Hales. Yeah. All right. Alex Hales, Fakhar Zaman, Shan Masood, mm. Riley Rousseau, who was a bona fide PSL legend and failed big time this time. And he's going to, he'll probably be playing in the IPL as well. So that's that's interesting mm. one. Very interesting one. Uh, so that's the top four. Hales, Fakhar, Shan, Riley. Then you've got Sarfaraz with the gloves uh, behind the stumps. Khushdil Shah at six. Mohammad Nawaz, who's just completely lost it. Yeah. I'd have him at seven. Uh, Daniel Sams at number eight. And he was the Andrew tie of this season for Karachi. Platinum pick. I don't understand why Karachi went for Ty and Sams. Because even Australia lost faith in those guys. Yeah, Sams is a weird one. Um, mm. I've never quite understood it. But yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Who else we got? So, Sams at eight. Mohammed Hasnan, who was recovering from injury, just came back, uh, went for plenty. He's at nine. Salman Irshad, Peshawar's slinger, who gets a lot of gigs in the circuit, T10 and all of that. He has to be my number 10. And Tabresh Shamsi had an absolute howler. Granted, he had diarrhea in some of those games. But you expected Shamsi to do better because he was good for Karachi last season. So he makes up the final uh, person in my flop 11. And, and not to mention, the fielding standards were extremely piss poor in this PSL. I was going to ask you, what, what was worse in this tournament? Fielding standards or crowds? Yeah, well, the crowds were just abysmal in Karachi, right? So yeah. if you take the cr crowds in Lahore, Islamabad or Rawalpindi, sorry, and Multan, you got full houses. And Rawalpindi is known to produce full houses even if it's a dead rubber in, in test cricket, like a day with no consequence, they'll still turn up. So it was electric in Rawalpindi. Gaddafi was really good. Partizan, which is also good. They, they just support Lahore like anything. And Multan is a smaller centre, so the crowds always kind of turn up over there and they really like to support their home team. Karachi was terrible. And there could be a multitude of reasons for this because they, uh, it's, the stadium is located next to two universities, I believe, uh, two hospitals, one naval base and a very crowded neighborhood in Karachi. So it could be a Partridge combination. A tree. Yeah, it could be a combination of the location and, you know, just the fact that that area always has traffic. Imagine having a PSL game over there. It could be a combination of that, uh, poor, you know, preparations and facilities for fans. And the fan experience is terrible. So you're saying the between, stands aren't very good, are they? Stands are bad and you have like these giant barbed wire fences which d disrupt the view. And you also, you know, uh, the seating isn't great. You've got pillars in between. So I think the reason that Karachi didn't turn up for these games and doesn't turn up historically as well, ever since cricket has come back to Pakistan, Karachi doesn't turn up. The combination of these two things could be the reason I'm not ready to buy the notion that people in Karachi have lost their appetite for cricket. But they did turn up in the final two games. And in the final, it was a full house. So at least they saved the PSL from those blemishes and turned up on a Monday night. So it maybe makes up for the lack of crowds in the games prior in Karachi. But yeah, I'd say the fielding standards were definitely more. Um, and just lastly, where, where, where do you think the PSL is at the moment as a franchise league? That's a fantastic question. And uh, had you, you asked it. me... <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to give it away. <laughs> I think it's an important I just want to slag answer. off the fielding in Karachi. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Uh, if you'd asked me this question a couple of years back, I would have said that after the IPL, the PSL is the biggest league in, in the world because it's Pakistan's league. Everyone adores it in this country and it had ga gathered mm. a huge fan following outside of Pakistan as well. And, you know, in the first few seasons, uh, it attracted top talent. Now, while this season of the PSL was very competitive, you had lots of final ball thrillers. It was it made for great viewing. If Are you, you think George Linder is not top talent? <laughs> Well, I mean, that's uh, the jury's still out on that one, right? Are you saying Daniel Sams being one of your elite players is <laughs> top, top talent? <laughs> Daniel Sams was a platinum pick, right? Uh, so yeah, I believe in terms of uh, competition, it was great. It made for some spectacular viewing because a lot of those games went right down to the wire. Lots of thrillers, lots of nail biters. But in terms of quality, I feel like the PSL has definitely dropped off when it comes to acquiring, uh, you know, foreign mm. talent because it's bookended by the IPL, which is the big you know, cash cow and every player wants to kind of play the IPL. The PSL was like a launch pad for players to play the IPL. You have the likes of Tim David, Harry Brook. Um, who else can I think of right now? Uh, some uh, other Col players. Yeah, I mean, there have been heaps that have kind of yeah. gone there and changed their careers and, and stuff. It was, it was really important. It was one of the leagues that, because it was so not similar to the IPL, but in a, a major Asian league, it allowed the IPL owners to have a look at overseas players yeah. and be like, well, okay, 
you know, we, we know that they're not just dominating in Australia and South Africa. These players can really play. And yeah. it does feel now a little bit like it's a local league, which we've mm. seen with the Big Bash as well. And, and you know, even the 100 is a little bit like yeah. that at the moment. So it is yeah. different. It, it, it was a feeder league of sorts to the IPL. And they did provide yeah. Luke Wood to the Mumbai Indians this year. But you see less of that now because you didn't have a Harry Brook or Tim David or even a Phil Salt for that matter. But uh, on one end, you have the IPL. And on the other hand, you have four leagues running in tandem. The Bangladesh mm. Premier League, the Big Bash League. And the worrisome ones are SA20 because you've got Indian money in it. So that's obviously going to attract top talent. And the ILT20 has all of the best stars the in the world. The same talent. <laughs> yeah, basically. So now you've got those four leagues and the IPL and the PSL sandwiched in between. And I, I get how Pakistan or the PCB would want a designated window for the PSL when there's no other franchise T20 cricket happening at that time. Mm. But a lot of these players want to rest at that time so that they can play the IPL because they're earning bucket loads in either SA20 or ILT20 and then bucket loads in the IPL. And the PSL has been compromised. So moving forward, I believe the PSL, to get back to that level of best league after the IPL, will have to maybe change their window a bit. Also, Jared, it doesn't help that these foreign players have to remain in hotels all the time. That's not a, mm. a puller, right? Uh, other places no. they can go and have fun. In the PSL, they don't even get to experience Pakistan. They get to experience the hotels and that's that. Maybe some golf and you got to cap it over there. So I believe that they need to look into these things, fix these things. And the PSL is still a big puller in terms of viewership because Pakistan is huge, right? Lots of people mm. love this league. And as a brand, maybe the PSL doesn't even rely on foreign talent anymore because it's just become so big in Pakistan. But for the quality of the league to get better in future, in the future, you'd have to maybe move the window around, maybe have it later in the year. Right, so that when you're not you have it though, it's really tricky because mm. you can't have it in October, right? Because that's going to run into ICC events. Um, November might also run into ICC, mm. so you can maybe have it early November to mid December, which I do think is kind of open at the moment. Yeah, but there isn't many other times in the year when it works. Like you're up against all the other tournaments for for the rest of the year. Mm. You can't have it in the summer because that's not feasible in Pakistan. I would have to say October, November, December, somewhere in there, squeeze out a month and have more double headers if that means squeezing it out in the month, right? They did it this time. It was a bit of an overkill in terms of covering it. I was burnt out. But I feel like they still have a solid brand to build on. It's mm. kind of dropped off maybe this year in terms of quality and foreign talent. But the competition itself is lit. People love to watch it. And, mm. you know, it has built a bit of a fan following over the years. I know a lot of people who are not Pakistani and enjoy the PSL on my Twitter, right? So they can still kind of salvage this situation if they maybe move the window and, you know, allow a bit more luxury to foreign players, you know, have them tour the cities, uh, even if it means disrupting traffic, because they're going to be more keen to come to Pakistan. It's not easy. It's bubble life, but it's not bubble life, right? That's yeah. what it is. But yeah, no, that, that that's where sense. I see the PSL. No, you know, I understand that. Um, thank you very much for coming on. The it sounds weird saying that to you, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> thank you very much for coming on the show. Yeah, pleasure's all mine. Thanks to the kind folks at FlexiSpot for looking after my office and my butt by sending me their E7 Pro desk that save your favorite desk heights at a touch of a button. You don't have to crank anything. This thing just finds the height that you like and you can work. And their BS12 Pro Chair that supports my posterior while I'm recording, well, this ad and all my shows. If you need great desks, especially ones that change heights or the best quality chairs, head on over to FlexiSpot today.